Okay. Thank you, Sean, for sharing. It looks great. Good. Um, I'm assuming Richard's hand's the old hand from before the coffee break. So to get us started on time for the last and final stretch of, of a very long day, uh, I'd like to introduce Anna Paul from Bauer, who's going to take us through a survey that was done um, and some discussion around it in terms of identifying the barriers between science and regulatory tools. And I'll hand over to you there, Anna. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Klaus. Um, yes, indeed. So Eric Flicker um, and Elisabeth Heunisch and myself, we worked on the presentation for today um, to basically present you the first um, results from the survey that was performed by NanoHarmony. However, we are not alone. The whole team of Work Package 3 and NanoHarmony in collaboration with Work Package 2 works on identifying barriers between science and regulatory tools. Um, so yeah, there's a whole team behind and it's my pleasure today presenting you the first result. Next slide, please, John. So here is a short um, agenda, what we're aiming uh, through this one hour session today. So first of all, I would like to provide a background of the NanoHarmony survey so that everybody's informed. And then um, a brief um, part of why we actually need OECD test guideline developments, um, a short introduction to the OECD test guideline development process. And then we actually would also um, love to hear, hear your um, experiences with this process, with different phases of the process, where you see obstacles and barriers. And for this, we actually would like to use the Mentimeter tool. Here's already the code, and you can already um, yeah, get your mobile device or your computer ready for answering Mentimeter questions. I also posted the link in the chat. So we are looking forward to have a really um, broad discussion with everybody here in this session and a really good exchange on this topic. And of course, we have some next steps, what we are planning to do, um, and this will be presented in the end. Great. Thank you. And next slide, please. So here's the background of the NanoHarmony survey. So basically the observations were that the development process of test guidelines, so OECD test guidelines and guidance documents can be really challenging. We heard a lot, lot about this also in the previous session. Um, and it also confirms that this process is really um, time consuming and effort consuming. And um, there are a lot of formal aspects in this process that actually also cannot be changed, but there are, and they are also good that they are there because they basically ensure um, partially that these methods that are developed are actually needed and that they um, basically re reproduce um, results that can be used by everyone. everyone. Um, and basically, once people follow these test guidelines, um, it's ensured that these results are obtained in a really good way. However, there are also a lot of um, small steps in this process that somebody sometimes are overlooked and um, that also can have a lot of challenges and, and provide barriers to people to transport um, information from science to regulatory tools. In NanoHarmony, objective six actually is directing into this um, topic because it asks for or it aims for having a future-proof structure that ensures that the information change between science and regulators is working well and also is um, yeah, smooth and in a timely manner. So what we do in NanoHarmony is basically mapping those obstacles and identifying the barriers. And also we would like to provide recommendations how we can overcome them. The survey is actually one first step or a step among other steps. Um, and we were actually uh, running the survey from June to um, September, end of September this year. Um, the goal was to learn about those challenges and issues along the OECD test guideline development process. And we wanted to learn that from different perspectives. So we asked actually in three different questionnaires, regulators, developers, and users of OECD test guidelines, how they see the process, where they see challenges, and what they actually suggest to overcome them. 
So here's a big thanks to everybody who took part on this uh, survey, who answered our questions. The questionnaire were really long. Sometimes uh, it can take up to 20 minutes. So we really appreciate it that people joined the survey and answered and shared their op um, opinion and um, yeah, their experiences. So we had 74 people taking part at the survey and they were nicely distributed among the three different groups. And today we're just presenting some of the results, not all of them that would just <laughs> not fit in this one hour, but we yes. picked some of them that we would like to learn about. Next slide, please. Great, so here I would like to inform you who actually are the people um, that part who participated in the survey. So we asked the regulators if they are actually familiar with the OECD process. Part of them were, and those who were actually also answered that they were involved already in the development of these test guidelines. Um, some of them are currently involved, some were previously, and some of them also know the process, but they were not involved yet. For the developers, uh, we also ask the same question. We ask, are you at the moment or were you uh, develop, um, involved in the development process? Most of them actually were, <laughs> and that's probably also why they um, why they um, registered in this uh, for this questionnaire. And we then ask them if they are actually involved in more test guideline development or guidance document development. Some of them were also in both. That's also interesting for us. And we will look into this in more detail because sometimes it can happen that if you are involved in both, this also depends on each other and can also bring other barriers that people who are only involved in one development do not experience. We also asked the users if uh, whether they know OECD test guidelines, most of them did. And those who did, we actually asked if they also know test guidelines that are um, especially for nanomaterials. And also here we saw that most of them actually are aware of these test guidelines. Next slide, please. So here comes the first Mentimeter question that we actually have for you. So we thought it's time for a little bit interaction. Thanks for logging in to menti.com. You can enter the code. And then I already see some people are just um, re registering for one of the groups. So just take the one that you feel yeah, you belong to. Great, I see a lot of bars appearing. If somebody has any problems with the Mentimeter, just write in the text so we can help you out. So you have 75 people, but I'm not sure you should wait for all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not, <laughs> but I think we're now at 21, so a little bit more, I think would, would be nice. Let's see if we have somebody from the CROs also here in our audience today. But so far, I see it's mainly academic industry and regulators and others. So just to repeat that, links at the top and it's also in the there's a direct link in the chat that you can click on um to get in and, and be part of the voting i i will be a little bit interested in the other maybe somebody who take other likes to express um where where he would belong to maybe we missed one group or two <laughs> if if you're other and you're one of the people without microphones you can just stick it in the chat good point yeah so fleming here i i don't consider myself coming from academy or a regulator. So it's a governmental research institute, which is not exactly the same as the other categories. Very good. Thank you, Fleming. That's that's a very good point. Yeah. OK, 
Okay, so I see 31 answers already. Maybe we wait a couple of seconds more and people would like to register. It's also connected to the next Mentimeter question, so it would be really nice if every, everybody who likes to participate can um, yeah, group them to one of these groups. Okay, I, so we have the timer running down. I, yeah, there was one more. Um, but I don't see much more entering the Mentimeter. I think we can move then to the next question. So this question asks, how do you relate yourself with the OECD test guidelines and guidance documents? And actually here we will see connected answers. So whenever you, for example, registered for the academics, we will see um, now also which of those groups are connected with the OECD test um, guidelines and in which way. It's a pity that only one answer can be given in this case. Oh, that's a good point, yes. <laughs> you have to tick then the one that you feel most um, related to. So, so far, 17, so most of them were involved, most of you actually are involved in the development of test guidelines, which is really good because we also have a lot of questions afterwards um, for your experiences with these development processes. But we also see um, that we have a lot of people who use the data for regulatory context and for obtaining data. I think we have the same number of answers that we have had in the previous question, so we can move to the next one. Thank you, everybody, for yeah joining these questions and for answering. So this question now relates to if you were in the development of test guidelines and how many of them you have been involved so far. Obviously, this only refers to the people who are in the development process. I'm expecting around 17 answers, which, which we have now. <laughs> so, yeah, so, okay. So most of those who were in the development say that they had one to two, which I think is good to see. We also have two that actually developed already more than five. Good, I think we have a good overview also, um, yeah, about the audience that is here today. And I think we can move to the next slide. So yeah, thanks for joining this Mentimeter. It's, it's really good to know who is here today. Um, we will now continue with some um, results that we obtained during the online survey and um, come back later with a lot of other questions that will um, relate to the results that, that we are presenting now. 
So why do we actually need OECD test guidelines? Or also the question could be asked, what are these OECD test guidelines used for? Um, here we have some answers that were obtained in the user questionnaire. So those answers were given by people who actually use test guidelines for obtaining data. And they said that they use it for regulatory purposes, but they also use it for international cooperation um, and also for assessing safety of chemicals and in this case, nanomaterials. And of course, uh, using test guidelines also ensures the comp comparability of results. So we can see that actually there's a broad range of why one could use OECD test guidelines. And we also asked the users if they actually in their facility use test guidelines. Most of the answers were yes. And of those who said yes, we asked also if they um, use actually test guidelines for nanomaterials. And here we also see a broad majority of users who are actually using um, test guidelines for nanomaterials. And yeah, that's already a good um, starting point. And from this, we can move to the next slide. Um, because we also asked, um, for example, the regulators, why we actually do need further test guideline developments. So one point is to use those that are already there, but the question is also, do we need additional ones and why do we need the test guideline development? And here we got some answers that, uh, yes, we need because um, they are um, the ones that are there, they are outdated due to new materials or new methods. Some of them also said, yes, we need because there's actually none available for um, the regulatory purposes or requirements. And um, we also got um, the comments that um, test guidelines are missing for some endpoints, for example, and some are not clearly applicable for nanomaterials. And we put a quote here, for example, so that the applicability of test guidelines to nano and advanced materials is not always clear and it would be good to label or state clearly in the scope of nanomaterials if the scope of nanomaterials can be tested with this test guideline or guidance document. So this also points already towards another point um, that basically um, is one, one side is the development of test guidelines, but the other point is also um, how these test guidelines should be actually uh, composed. So what should they provide? And um, this brings us to the next slide where we actually had similar questions to the users. So we also asked them, do you see um, needs for the development of OEC test guidelines? Interestingly, they uh, mentioned the same points. So they also said yes, because they are not applicable, because they are, for, and especially not applicable for nanomaterials. And they also said yes, because they are missing test guidelines and or special endpoints, but they also gave clear hints that some test guidelines um, miss um, things that they that they really need, or the um, things that we also can take into account when developing new test guidelines. For example, that some of the test guidelines are difficult to perform or understand, or that new equipment is needed. So whenever developing um, a test guideline, I believe this also points towards how um, they can be read in the end and how they can actually be applied. So this is something that could be taken into account when um, developing a test guideline. Also, they mentioned that large quantities of material are needed um, and um, it's difficult or yeah, for them an issue to explain changes to regulators. However, they also had some suggestions. Um, for example, it was suggested to have further cooperation with CROs in the development process. They suggested to simplify uh, or simply language that should be used. Um, they also suggested to clarify controls or reference materials um, that are needed for minimal characterization. And also they asked uh, or suggested that it would be great to have some examples of case studies where they can actually refer to. 
And uh, here again, we have two quotes from the survey. So one says too technical for local industry and workers to understand. And also it was addressed that there are too many conditions to be tested and the concentration at which the experiment should be performed is not clear. So this points all towards, yes, we need the development of test guidelines and we also need um, a clear look at how these test guidelines are developed and what they actually contain. This was really interesting for us. And on the next slide, we actually see um, in which sections these test guidelines or new test guidelines could or should be developed. So here we see regulators' answers and users' answers. And we ask them for the different uh, sections of so physical properties, the environmental fate and behavior, um, then the effects on biotic systems, health effects, and um, residues in chemistry, and also for uh, no need for development. And we got a really broad distribution of the test guidelines that they actually should suggest that, sh that should be developed. And on the right side, you can see all those suggestions. And interestingly, many of those suggestions of new test guidelines or adopted ones, they are already taken up by OECD. So this is also a really good thing that we can see, okay, the regulators and the users are actually in need of those test guidelines that are uh, under development at the moment. Next slide, please. Okay, so now we have seen the answers of uh, users, regulators, and developers regarding why we need OECD test guideline developments. And now we would like to have a closer look at the OECD test guideline development process. So as I said in the beginning, this process um, can be time and labor consuming. And you also heard it in the session before and probably experienced it. And um, even for projects where uh, it was thought that they are straightforward, it will take usually up to two years um, to develop an OECD test guideline. This is a very formal process. And our aim here is not to um, fasten this process, or change anything in the, um, um, or make dramatic changes to the formal process. That's not our goal or our aim here, but our aim is to understand where are actually the challenges and um, what are um, things that could help people when going through those processes and when, um, yeah, facing such a barrier that they actually can have guidance how to overcome it and how to move through this process um, more smooth. And yeah, I here just took um, a Mentimeter survey that was made uh, last year uh, um, on the how, how fast or how slow the process is. Um, and here, I think as similar as shown before, it was stated that yes, this process is really slow, but also some people said, yes, it's right in pace. And I think that's also shows that because all those test guidelines need validation and they need a formal process where they go through. It's just that sometimes people are struggling with the duration of this process. And um, that's also what we asked during the survey. Next slide, please. So here we have the formal process of an OECD test guideline for nanomaterials, where this, so this development has to go through all those steps. Um, and basically it first has all the part that is related to the uh, working party of manufactured nanomaterials, so OECD, WPMN. And then once this is accomplished, it goes to the OECD, WNT, so the working group of national coordinators of the test guideline program. Starting from the left side, we, for today and also for the survey, we grouped this process into three phases. So the first phase actually is the project proposal and the SPSF phase. This starts at the OECD WPMN and then moves to the WNT. And this uh, phase actually 
apart from all those steps that have to be done, um, also um, is comprised of a lot of um, intermediate steps or steps that have to be performed by those who are developing the test guideline. So just to mention a couple of those, um, one is, um, yes, to write the actual project proposal that can be then handed in to the WPMN. But for writing this, often a literature research is needed, a search on all the available methods is needed, also a close um, interaction or close communication with experts is needed, an expert group usually is formed, and then once this goes through a WPMN, um, it has um, the next step is basically to write the SPSF. And um, it also goes through commenting around at WPMN and then moves to the WNT. And where it's again commented and then finally approved. And so these are steps that everybody has to go through when developing an OECD test guideline for nanomaterials and that already can have some challenges. And we will have a look at the challenges uh, that were um, mentioned during the survey at the next slides. But just to stay on this slide, I would like to show that also phase two, which start sometimes parallel to phase one is very important because the phase two is the actually technical development. Sometimes um, this runs in parallel uh, and it also uh, contains steps that are formal, but also has a lot of steps that have to be into, taken into account, such as forming the expert group and then writing the SOPs, doing some pretests for the methods, and to also adjust, um, for example, parameters, harmonize different test methods if there are different um, test methods available, and then perform some round robin or interlaboratory comparison between different laboratories to also prove that these methods are producing reliable results. And you also need to have test materials, which can take long and can be really difficult. And then once the uh, round robin or interlaboratory comparison is performed, we we'll need to do the data analysis and uh, combine all those um, components uh, also in a validation report. So those are all parts that, that are behind this phase two and can be really challenging. Um, also finding laboratories who would like to participate in these experiments and so on and so forth. And phase three is then the commenting and approval phase. This happens at uh, WNT level. Once uh, all the technical development is performed, you have a commenting round at OECD, and then usually you have some expert group meetings and you have probably another uh, commenting round or a third one. So also phase three can have a lot of challenges such as uh, the communication with the experts, um, answering and reacting to comments. Also it is difficult um, to, or it has to be taken into account that the experts who took part at the technical development still Still need to be there for also answering and reacting to the comments. So it, it can seem like after the technical development one is ready because the, uh, the test guideline is written. However, there's a big portion of, of um, things that are still coming and one needs to have the finances and also the um, experts at hand to go through this third phase. So let's have a look at the answers uh, that we got during the survey for the different three phases. Next slide, please. Thank you. So here we have the developers and how they actually um, went through the pre-development phase, so the project proposal and SPSF phase. Um, we saw that Mm, only one third roughly had problems or challenges during this phase. Um, and here we stated some of the challenges that they reported. So um, they said that they had no or slow or irrelevant responses. Um, they had some inconsistency in requests um, and lack of support from other stakeholders was observed. Um, also a disagreement between the different stakeholders. 
Unfortunately, some had blocking by a single member and also long time between meetings to discuss the proposal. So these were challenges that were observed during the first phase and we have some suggestions. So one suggested to have a better management process at OECD, which I assume can be also very tricky. Um, and then ensure that the involvement of relevant and informed stakeholders is needed. Um, and then somebody suggested to have a more formal role of stakeholder commenting. So yeah, these were already good suggestions that we got during the survey. Next slide, please. And we stay with the developers and we also ask them if they found it difficult to actually generate a project schedule in the SPSF, which is actually mandatory. And uh, some of them said yes. And uh, we asked them what did they face actually in the, or why did they think it's difficult uh, to develop that or generate this? And um, some of them said that they en encountered experimental unknowns. Um, that the lack of experience of this process was difficult. And the, another point was establishment of collaborations that um, was faced and was difficult. Um, we got some comments that it's difficult to follow the timelines. Um, so yeah, they, were had, they had some shifting of schedule for many projects. Um, some others said that um, it's difficult to follow the schedule due to dependencies on input um, of own expenses on, on, on own expenses. And um, some others said advances and new developments of techniques impact on the development. So those were actually barriers or challenges that they observed during the first phase. Next slide, please. And then moving to phase two, the technical development, we asked the regulators um, if in which phase of this process um, towards the um, development of a test guideline, they encountered most difficulties. Um, and this points also already almost to the third phase, but it also matches with this um, phase two, because they said, yes, they had problems when development of the OECD test guideline and expert discussion and the validation of the test guideline and peer review by expert group. And some had issues with the public commenting. Um, for the challenges, um, they said that a combination of scientific and technical difficulties with regulatory purposes. Um, they also had problems with time constraints, missing experts, um, limitation of test guidelines and regulatory acceptance under the mutual acceptance agreement and criticism regarding regulatory application at a quite late stage. But they also had some suggestions. So they suggested to involve experts with practical hands-on experience, also a balanced approach to consider regulatory needs in uh, terms of deriving hazard conclusion confined confidentially. And um, they also suggested to have an early engagement with regulators, which was also mentioned in the session before. And also that it would be good to prioritize the work on test guideline development. Next slide, please. And then we come already to the third phase, which is the commenting and approval. Here we ask um, the developers if um, this reviewing process identified significant unexpected issues uh, and questions, and if those also um, led to delays. And we asked for reasons, and some of them said um, yes, because there was a change of the state of the art. Some said uh, that open issues only came up during the last phase of drafting the test guideline. They also faced conflicting comments, which I assume are really difficult to tackle sometimes. And they asked, said that same comments came up again and again, and uh, that it was also um, yeah, difficult to address them at some point. And um, we asked if they have some actions in mind that they could have um, done at an earlier stage. And uh, two points were mentioned that it's important to keep an eye out for the regulatory changes or developments to always um, yeah, be on the right track. And also it would be good to anticipate the potential questions up front 
Um, I think this relates to the um, outcomes that we had in the beginning, where actually the users also asked um, or yeah, suggested how the test guidelines should be written so that they should be easy to understand, easy to follow. And, as, and sometimes um, maybe writing it already with having the users in mind could help also to avoid um, comments or to yeah, tackle these, these challenges. Um, next slide, please. Mm. Okay. I, oh, I don't see the next slide. Uh, I just continue. Maybe. Um, you no, still I, don't, I don't know either. Okay, but you can still hear me. That's that's already yeah. great. <laughs> it feels a little bit lonely here. Uh, <laughs> okay, I just continue uh, because I think the next slide is uh, easy also uh, to talk through without seeing it. So basically, I now showed all the different um, comments that we got for the for the different faces. Oh, here it goes. Perfect. Thank you, Sean. So, but we also have some general issues and suggestions. Um, okay, now I cannot see the slide anymore. Um, and the general um, issues that people actually had uh, that appeared in different phases are actually lack of funding um, and that staff is changing. So people are not. Okay, yeah, probably. Um, <laughs> so I just. See in the chat that that maybe internet issues occurred. Um, no worries, we will manage. Um, so yeah, we have uh, issues that can occur in all those phases, and these are basically lack of funding that the staff is changing, and uh, not uh, yeah um, not staying throughout the whole process, which makes it difficult. Also, if you always have new colleagues jumping in. Thank you. Um, and then, yeah, ensuring the engagement with stakeholders is also um, a challenge that, that is um, faced in all those phases, basically. And it's sometimes also a challenge to motivate experts to take part in the development and to support the testing and uh, also comment in time, obviously. And um, when we ask the developers which of those phases uh, or part of this development process they felt most anxious about, we got a really broad view of basically each phase was covered and, and yeah, each phase has challenges that people have to overcome. Next slide, please. And uh, here we again see some challenges for the whole process from the regulatory side. So they also said, that they have some delay or some said that they have delay in progress and uh, due to a loss of scientific partners or funding. Some experienced late commenting and also uh, it was mentioned that the regulatory view versus the industry view is sometimes really different, different, different. And um, yeah, it, it needs to be tackled at that point. But we also have some suggestions. Um, we got the suggestion that flexibility in funding would be one idea. Um, and it will be or need, needs to be considered the regulatory need and to check whether the test guideline is still appropriate. Um, and then realistic time plans are always good. Um, yeah, sometimes you never know what happens around you, but it's always good to have a somehow realistic plan. And then, um, yeah, scientific expertise should be available throughout the whole process and also um, during the commenting. Um, so that's still part of the process and it should not be underestimated. Next slide, please. So those were the first results that we got from the survey. We will definitely dive deeper into all the answers. We're really thankful that a lot of people shared their experiences and there are a lot of connections that we can make also with the answers that we got throughout the um, other stakeholder 
um, interactions such as the sessions yesterday. And uh, speaking about interactions, I think now it's time for us to move to the uh, discussion round and to basically um, get an overview of your experiences and how you um, see this process, where are your um, difficulties and your suggestions. As I said, we prepared some Mentimeter slides and basically they um, sometimes refer again to those three phases that we mentioned here. So the project proposal and SPSF phase as the first one, then the phase two is the technical development and phase three the commenting and approval um, phase. And now on the next slide, we will start again with the mentee and we will be really happy to see you answering the question. So the first question is actually, in which phase do you see the biggest challenges? This refers to the three phases that I mentioned before. Um, so the project proposal, technical development and commenting. I'm already seeing answers getting in. Thanks a lot. So if somebody needs the code or just joined our session, you can go to menti.com and enter the code that is written at the top of the slide. And just feel free to share your experiences with us. So, so far, I only see people ticking phase two and phase three. So those are the most challenges, challenges hidden between these phases. So, and the most challenging one is the technical development so far. So it doesn't, I guess it doesn't mean there's none in phase one. They're just not as big as the others. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Okay. I see 26 answers, five answers. So maybe we we'll wait a couple of seconds more. So that everybody can pull out menti.com again. I think there are not more coming. Um, let's move to the next question. So here we asked towards phase one. Uh, this is the project proposal phase. Uh, it was not the one where most of you saw the most challenges, but we still would like to learn um, out of those potential challenges that or steps that we put here what are um, the most and the least um, challenging steps for you. So you can rearrange them such that you have an order. So we basically put the project proposal at WPMN, um, the phase where the project is at WPMN and drafting the SPSF, um, also SPSF commenting round um, can be challenging the submission of the SPSF uh, at WNT, and uh, also the commenting around at WNT can be challenging, and then hopefully the formal approval um, doesn't bear any challenges for once you went through all this process. Now we see a clear picture, which is moving still. <laughs> Good. Nice to see these bars floating. <laughs> I will give you a while to rearrange them as you wish.
right. So I see 11 people already rearranged the different steps that we have in phase one. Maybe a couple of minutes more. But so far, I see that submission of the SPSF at WNT is the most challenging one. Just together with the SPSF commenting round, which is connected, I think. And so far, the least challenging one is the project and the project proposal at WN at PMN. Looking at the time, I think we can move to the next to the next slide. So it's interesting to see that the SPSF is the most challenging one, which I can also assume it's good to see. Um, now we're actually, since you uh, encountered or at least think of encounter, think that there are some challenges in phase one, we ask what are your suggestions to actually overcome these challenges? also still in phase one. So um, you can type in some free text um, or yeah, if you have any suggestions, how the SPSF can be um, yeah, move more smoothly through the commenting round or um, how it can transition to the WNT. And I see the first text coming in. Thanks a lot for sharing your experience. Yeah, so the one that I read already is uh, start ex expert group early and ensure communication. I think that's a really good point. Uh, I think communication is often a big challenge, but also the key to um, ensure that like all stakeholders are in involved and engaged. Joining the meetings is always also helpful, I think. Yeah, and, and somebody mentioned the lack of uh, engagement with the CROs, also pointing towards that, that we didn't see somebody from the CRO um, being here today, or at least not in the mentee um, um, question. Yes, so I think that was also one point that is discussed in the last session, which is really important because they are the ones who deal with the test guideline in the end. Thank you all for sharing your suggestions for phase one. Um, yeah, I think that's good, giving a little bit more time and then we'll move to the next slide. It also um, yeah, confirms um, what was also mentioned during the survey um, to get informed about the process and also to show the regulatory demand um, of your proposal. So I think that's, that's a good suggestion too. And also being prepared for the regulatory needs. And that's also in the same line that was also mentioned during the last session during the survey that it's good that yeah there are similar suggestions
Great. So let's move to the phase two, which was one of the most challenging in the couple of slides ago. So uh, I'm sure you um, yeah, can type in here or like choose one, um, basically one step that is the most challenging in phase two. I can assume that some of them are quite challenging, so it can be tricky to choose one most, but I'm sure you, you can find one that you think is the most challenging one. So we have the formation of expert group that can be challenging, literature research, determination of the scope, um, and then development of standard operating procedures. Then of course the interlaboratory comparison and the validation report and then drafting the test guideline in the end. So, so far, I see the majority for the interlaboratory comparison, um, followed by the validation report, also clearly connected with each other. So, if somebody of you has at any point through this Mentimeter some points you would like to explain or, or yeah, spend a little bit more details on it, feel free to either put it in the chat or yeah, just speak out. So far the interlaboratory comparison is still the one where the most challenges are seen or observed. And formation of expert group so far uh, is not the most challenging one. Nobody saw it as a most challenging one. But it's, I think, a little bit tricky probably to choose one which is the most challenging. So yeah, I see Carol put a comment in the chat. So yeah, I can imagine that this is another uh, challenge. Yeah, so reach consensus in the approach. Um, yeah. Different techniques. Very good point. Thanks. Okay, moving to phase three, which is actually the commenting and approval phase. So we have a free text here that you can put all the challenges that you already experienced or that you can think of uh, and that can happen in phase three. So we are looking forward to your, um, your challenges. <laughs> Any challenges in phase three that you observe? Ah, here. <laughs> yeah, I think the first one is really good. Um, it's important to have, have the comments in a timely manner and then also 
um, have some discussion with the experts to find consensus. Yeah, another one points to new people um, that have not been involved earlier, comment late in the process with different views and lack of understanding. And this can be really challenging, I think. Um, and also, I think the different opinions and yeah, having conflict, conflicting comments is really difficult to tackle in this way. Again, we see the CRO involvement. So I think this is really an important point that goes throughout the different phases and should be tackled. So, um, yeah, thanks for sharing your um, your insights on challenges. So phase three is the commenting and approval phase, basically the last phase that the test guideline has to go through. So after the technical development, still the WNT is having several commenting rounds um, and with a lot of feedback uh, on, on the test guideline that is actually already written and um, yeah last phase. All right, um, I think let's move to the next question. Thanks a lot for sharing your insights. Um, this is another not free text question. Um, so it, re it relates to the general issues that were mentioned in the survey. So throughout the whole process, uh, you can rank or yeah, take those um, issues that if and say if you disagree or agree or steps in between with the lack of funding, the problem of changing staff, the communication, uh, which basically is the communication with different stakeholders. Uh, communication can also be um, the comments that, that one gets through the test guideline development. And then the last one is the engaging with experts. The experts are really needed for the expert group and, and the commenting throughout the whole development process. So I see that there is a really um, load towards the agree. So a lot of you agree with these um, general issues that were observed in the survey. Thank you, Klaus, for giving us a little bit more time. We still have, I think, two questions left and then some next steps that we will take to um, yeah, provide more um, information on, on these barriers and how to overcome them. So I think lack of funding is one of the 
most agreed ones. Communication also is a really important issue uh, in all places. Are there any general issues that we didn't mention here? So maybe if you have some general issues that are independent of the phase of this development process, you can just put it in a text and we're happy to, to see where you have. Or maybe is this is the next question. I'm sorry. <laughs> maybe I think we asked this in the next question. Yes, we asked this in the next question. So <laughs> you can provide that in the in the free text in the next. You can already prepare yourself um, for other challenges that you encounter. All right, so yeah, here it goes. What are, are there any general issues that you see as important challenges in this OECD test guideline development process? Oh yeah, pandemics are a really great issue. <laughs> I can see that point. Yeah, indeed, this is, uh, it was also mentioned in the survey. Obviously this is something that, uh, yeah, that was really yeah, causing a lot of struggle, not only in the OECD test guideline development, but also in our daily life, indeed. And the CROs again, yes, this is definitely a point that, that will be uh, taken as a take home message from today that this will be really important. Somebody mentioned getting the ring test and validation resources sponsored or resources and sponsoring, so they can run effectively with enough participants more easily. Also the participation uh, slightly, or yeah, it's slightly less when there's a pandemic around, but funding would also help indeed. So looks like some of some of the issues that that people are mentioning here are also already suggestions um, how to how to overcome issues. Um, this is actually also our last uh, slide. So yeah, we ask about the general issues that that you see as challenges, and then um, obviously we we're really happy to learn from your suggestions. If there's something you'd like to um, 
share more details, just feel free to also um, lift your hand or put it in the chat. I think we can move to the to the last uh, question. This is about the suggestions. As I said, some of these suggestions were already mentioned here, but if you have more suggestions for the improvement of this process, uh, we are happy to, to see them here in the pretext. Um, and this is also our last Mentimeter question that we have prepared for you today. So you can yeah, type in all suggestions that come to your mind. So the first one is continuation of funding as a suggestion. The involvement of all relevant stakeholders as early as possible in the process. And somebody suggests to have an exchange between the WT, WNT and WPMN. <laughs> somebody would like to put Thomas in charge. <laughs> Somebody mentioned to have a virtual or on paper catch up session after the WNT or WPMN meetings uh, were only small issues. Um, for, for those test guidelines, were only small issues lead to a failure of um, passing through the stage. Somebody is suggesting to have a better guidance on the development process. So I think this is a really good and important point um, that also um, yeah, leads to the next steps that, that are already foreseen and that still will be um, developed and, and yeah, fine-tuned. Somebody asked for more support from the Secretariat. Thank you, Thomas, for putting your comment in the chat to have biannual meetings with the OECD people, one virtually if possible.
there anything else related to the OECD process you would like to mention? Just the reason why I put it here uh, in the chat, I tried to submit already before, but somehow it is eaten up from my handy. So the text does not appear on the screen, but I send it. <laughs> okay, I hope it will be in the in the final document that will be from Minty. Sorry about this. But not your mistake. <laughs> I've just added them. Perfect. All right. That, that um, happened also to me. So it might be that for some of the questions, people have tried to enter information, but it's actually not accepted. All right. I'm, I'm really sorry to hear that. So if you and those people are motivated, just put it in the, uh, in the chat and then we'll, we'll store it um, and include it to the comments that we got through Menti. Thanks a lot still for, for trying um, and yeah. We're looking forward to your comments in the text. So, so Anna, will the questions then be uh, available or the slides be available so people can go back to the slide for the questions? Um, I'm not fully in sure, but I think the um, presentation right. will be in YouTube also later on. Um, okay. But maybe in the chat, give us a little hint towards uh, which. <laughs> I guess we can put up a Google document where people can enter them in later. All right. Sounds like a good plan. Yeah. Thanks. OK, thank you. All right. So I will just start with the last slide that we have. Um, thank you, everybody, for sharing your experiences and your ideas on how to improve this process or not sometimes not improving it, but for how to overcome those barriers that were actually, actually experienced by people. So we have this survey, we will dive deeper into all the answers that we got. We're really thankful for all the answers that we got already. And um, the survey was um, anonymous. However, we asked um, or invited some people to share their contact information at the last step of the survey so that we can actually have some follow-up interviews uh, by phone or by video conference to actually get an even more clear picture on their experiences. We are really thankful for this and we will, as a first step, continue with doing that. And then we aim for providing options for tackling the issues that were identified here and also throughout the different other um, stakeholder engagement processes. We aim for providing training material to inform and actually educate about the OECD test guideline development process. This was also mentioned in the um, suggestions, so I'm, I'm happy that this was mentioned and this, this can be one step of helping to overcome these barriers. And in general, we are working towards a future-proof structure that we uh, would like to provide um, and thereby ensure that information is exchanged by, uh, between science and regulators. And um, yeah, the sessions yesterday also helped towards this. And we from Work Package 3 and Work Package 2 in Nano Harmony will um, yeah, keep effort and working towards this so that we can build a legacy of Nano Harmony and ensuring that this information is um, yeah, exchanged and coming to a um, fruitful um, development of OC test guidelines. That's it from my side. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thanks for providing your input. Thank you, Sean, for sharing the slides and helping me with the Mentimeter. And thanks to Eric and Elizabeth for helping with the slides and setting up everything for today. Um, yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much, Anna. That, that was really good. Uh, and we'll all help each other write the request letter for refund to Sean's Wi-Fi provider. Um, excellent. The next person up is our illustrious leader, Thomas. To sum up the day. I'm afraid I've only left you 17 minutes, Thomas, so I hope you can manage. It's better to switch on the micro like a few people did before talking to the muted micro. It doesn't doesn't help. Nope. So before going into the summary and and having then in the end uh, the nice summary, thank you very much, Klaus, for 
going through all the sessions from this morning to now and uh, organizing that very well. And I certainly uh, appreciate very much the work of all the others to this, and I will come to it later on. So don't worry too much. Um, I just do you see my slug slide normally, or is it yeah. covered no, normally? It's fine. Okay, because I don't see my slide. I see some faces, and I don't know how to change it, so I leave it this way. Uh, top top right hand corner. Okay, um, thanks a lot. So workshop summary and next steps. And don't be too much afraid. Uh, certainly, I know we had a very, very long day. We started at nine o'clock and we have now nearly five o'clock. And for some other people, it meant other time periods of the day. So it's really tiresome and I will not make it too long, but I would very much like to do some summary of what was achieved and what was said today. So, um, we had three main aims of an, in NanoHarmony, which I introduced this morning. And the three main aims were the adoption of the development of new OECD test guidelines, the improving communication between all steward stakeholders, and analysis and suggestions for improvement and acceleration of TG and GD developments. So if looking at those points, I think we can clearly say that we tackled all those points today and all over during the period before which I think is very, very important that we really achieve the aim, what we are looking for. The part which may come came across during the last two session was more or less looking into what can we do better? What is the improvement? And this is our task. This is how we should look at it. But please also keep in mind that overall, we have an existing process which is very well working. There, is, uh, there are a lot of advantages and a lot of things really being done very well from the regulatory side, from the industry, from the researchers, and from the OECD as well. So um, it is not that we want to change everything. We just we want to optimize and have a look where we can use our resources more efficiently and may speed up or gain some more momentum or some more speed to really accelerate the development of new test guidelines and guidance documents or adaptation of those. And this, I think, is what we should keep in mind. It's not criticism. It's looking at some points. Where can we improve it? And in the end, it may be that we do not find too many options, but we have a look at it. And this can also be a result. We had three day workshop. As you see, there's always a three in the beginning, three main aims, three day workshops. And we had three types of sessions. We had the stakeholder sessions, uh, which were four stakeholder sessions yesterday morning. And I would like to mention specifically here that we did it in a way that we could cover all the different international partners involved in NanoHarmony and in, involved in OECD. And I very much appreciated all the industry people and all the regulators actively participating in these sessions, which is absolutely needed to see if there is something to be improved and if there is something to be made better. And certainly we had also the expert sessions. The expert session, as you will see, will continue tomorrow. Overall, we have nine different expert sessions and we have the open session as today. You may count this as one session or today as several sessions. The open session I would here in this case claim to be one. So we covered quite a big ground. As I said from the beginning, uh, more than nine, I think overall 14 test guidelines and guidance documents developments. Uh, were covered what we were uh, talking about today. We were discussing uh, about processes and improvements. We had an exchange. So overall, it was a very full day with a lot of different topics, a lot of points uh, to, to bring across. And that was extremely well done by everybody. And thanks to all of you there again. But having this workshop uh, now more or less as the open part of it uh, over, there are a few next steps similar to uh, the end, which uh, was uh, used before. There's a test, guide, test guideline development. This certainly will be continued with the experts and the scientists. This is something which will be ongoing after 18 months of NanoHarmony. It is also very important to see that the communication is a very big issue uh, really to bring all the different stakeholders um, online, in line, and to really get the things uh, sped up. 
So this is done by, for example, these open sessions, by the webinars and so on. And um, there will be in the future the uh, open sessions available on YouTube. And we will also uh, make it available from uh, the OECD. Oh, no, not available, but there will be also the next meeting in January uh, um, next year where there is a focus on FISCAM characterization meeting between OECD, the researchers, and uh, those will be continued over the next 18 months, at least by Nano Harmony. We have another topic, and that is the topic we were just talking about, analysis and distillation of acceleration options for OEC test guidelines and guidance, docu guidance document process developments. And here we have the survey, we have the stakeholder sessions, and we really will work, as was said before, Bana, that we will put it into actionable priority improvements, and which we then will make available and discuss to a larger community to see what momentum we can really create there. And uh, these developments will be all certainly communicated, and we have two major events coming up. The next event is scheduled um, on Monday, Tuesday before the WPMN meeting next year in June in Paris, and which is has a focus that where we will introduce the test guideline developments where we will have specific sessions on the improvements. And uh, then we have another meeting, which is more on the political side, on, on the side of, of, of setting a framework and giving that a continuity and improving or speeding up process of test guideline and standardization processes, which is currently scheduled for the beginning of 2023, which is near to the end of the Nano Harmony project. So in the end, within the next steps, it is a continuous effort to enable the development and harmonization of test guidelines, guidance document to keep pace with innovation in a timely manner. Which means, and Klaus, you said um, at the session before, it was something like a larger nano harmony may be needed or a continuous nano harmony is needed. So in a way, I think what, what, what was achieved with the Malta initiative and with all the people being involved worldwide in this uh, getting this done on, on standardization and harmonization, it's something where we moved a lot and it would be good if we could continue this to a certain level and give it a specific framework. And this is something we should think about and work on. How can we keep this kind of communication, this kind of uh, collaboration, this kind of um, exchanging the ideas and needs between each other? How can we make this a living framework or living um, area where we can exchange and work on it on, on a continuous level? Which may be not a larger nano harmony, but something which is set up in a framework uh, involving more stakeholders than currently being actually foreseen. So um, Klaus, certainly I do not mind to have a larger nano harmony, <laughs> something which uh, I think it's very nice and it's very good for us all to experience these feedbacks and these kind of, of, of discussion, sometimes different opinion coming together as was said before, but then seeing that there are solutions possible and that we can have a way forward. And that leaves me to the final question and comments. So this was more or less a little bit my personal view and summary on, on what was uh, happening during today or during this workshop. But maybe you all or some of you have some final comments, some questions overall to the different topics we were tackling during the whole day today. I wasn't expecting too many, to be honest, but I, I loved to give the platform because it also gives me the platform to, to tell to you that if you have uh, questions which are not final, but anything comes up, we are very happy if you contact us. And here I very much would like to thank again the collaboration with the OECD and with Marg uh, Gonzalez and uh, with the Nanomed project. And uh, you will see, you can see these here as a contact from, from Nanomed and with the OECD and some contacts here for Nano Harmony. Um, and please, you, you can also sign up for the newsletter and keep in touch on what is ongoing. And with this one, making also available later on, as said on YouTube's, I, oh, that's a good one. 
normally, ah, here it is. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I was somehow skipping it too far. It's a thanks to all of you. Certainly Thomas. Th yeah. Thomas, it's Flavia. Yeah, come on, Flavia. May, may I add the comment? Yes, absolutely. You certainly thank are allowed you, to have you. it. <laughs> um, from my point of view, it uh, should be very important uh, to um, discuss among the, all the projects involved because there is a strong cooperation in the, between, uh, I can say, four projects uh, on these developments um, on the uh, way how to, uh, to, um, to, to, to put the data uh, they, that will be produced in these projects. So this is an important point uh, to, to take into account because uh, many data will be produced and it is important that uh, these data are in the same platform, I, I imagine, I, I suggest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just a final comment from my side and bye-bye to everyone. Thank you, Flavia, and you are certainly absolutely right that we should take care of the data, make it available for future use uh, in different areas and certainly also for the standardization and harmonization area here. And thanks a lot again for all your contribution, Flavia. So then saying thanks to Flavia and saying thanks to all experts around the world. Um, for participating, for act, act, uh, actually contributing so much. Um, with, from my side, saying also thanks to the Nano Harmony te uh, team. It is really fun uh, working with you all together. And here, certainly, the work by uh, Sean, uh, Nicolina, uh, Chiara, and, and Klaus, and, and quite a few, which I'm now missed to mention, certainly. Without them, these kinds of sessions, organization, everything would not be possible. So a big thanks to all of you for, for organizing it in front, behind the, behind the scenes and, and getting and making it easy for or everybody for us to actually participate here online to this event. Thank you very, very much. Certainly national governments and uh, the associated partners are very important. And I would very much uh, thank the associated partners uh, for spending uh, and participating on their own expenses, uh, which should be mentioned and which is very, very important. I think OECD I mentioned before, and last but not least, session at chairs and rapporteurs. So the rapporteurs will have to do their jobs or may have already done so in writing up and giving a brief summary. And last but not least, the European Commission for funding and making this activity possible. So with that, and thanks to all of you, and I hope I didn't forget anybody uh, to say thank to. Um, I wish you all a very, very good day, uh, a rest of the day or a start in the morning. And uh, please send us your comments, keep in touch. And we hope to see you and meet you face to face next year in Paris or in Brussels and one of the next workshops. And we are looking forward to that. Stay safe, stay healthy and all the best to all of you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye